I'm going to talk about this mainly about the standard model today. Um, have you all? I got the impression last week that um, you all you haven't seen the standard model in the Higgs mechanism in class. Okay. All right. Well, there's one aspect of it that's quite nice, and um, that's how the gauge bosons get masses. There's another aspect of it that's not so nice, how the fermions get masses. And um, so we'll look at both of them. Um, first of all, we one part of the standard model is uh, quantum chromodynamics, which is 1 over 2 g squared the trace of f u nu f u nu minus psi bar gamma mu and here d mu is um, and this has an i g in it um, well I should never depart from the notes when lecturing. Um, here, uh, this this is capital D mu, and D mu is the covariant derivative for H U T, which is D mu plus A mu, and that's D mu times the identity matrix plus I G, and then uh, T B. A, B, mu. So this is the sum over the generators, over the eight generators. So if you want, B equals one to eight. Um, there are eight generators for um, SU3. Hey, Kevin, I have a question. Why, yeah, why, did, why do we need to trace? Oh, because they're matrices. The F's a matrix. Oh, well, let me write down what F is. F, of course, is. Um, Seven, Jeanette. And, and once again, the only time you ever call me is when I'm teaching, or at a faculty meeting, or a colloquium. But anyway, it's nice to hear from you. Bye. So this is T mu plus A mu, D mu plus A mu. And since the A's are matrices, you, you, the commutator gives you other matrices, and then you take the trace so that you don't have anything but fields left. Um, this psi that was sitting here is actually a uh, psi red, psi green, psi blue. And um, so this is actually a 12 component field. So 12 components because each direct field has four components. So this is a rather compact notation. And by the way, when you, in as much as there are eight gluons, um, when you start computing Feynman diagrams, you get lots and lots of um, diagrams because you see um, quarks, for example, going forward can exchange one gluon, but this gluon could split into two, and two gluons could come out, form a vertex, and Yeah, Peter, I'm teaching. Hello. 
Yeah, Peter, I'm teaching now. I teach until 7. Fine. Is the whole family calling? Youngest son. Okay, so it starts looking like this. And of course, these, these things can radiate, and the radiated blue ones can split, and can even split into into three like that. Um, and this surely has something, to, th this is probably why uh, the theory confines uh, objects. And um, it's that you just get. <laughs> That's important. Yes, Peter. Hello? Yeah, yeah, I'm teaching Peter. <laughs> anyway, um, what happens here is that you can get zillions of diagrams because there are eight gluons. Also, as we'll learn when we look at the renormalization group, the coupling constant gets smaller as you go to high energies, but it presumably goes, becomes larger at um, uh, at low energies, which is to say longer distances. Um, and at Hooft, many years ago, uh, wrote a paper in which he analyzed QCD analytically in the large N limit, where instead of SU3, which had eight gluons, he did, um, let us, uh, he took the number of colors going to infinity. And so then the number of gluons is n squared minus 1, because it would be sun, where n is, you know, a million or something. And there he saw that we had confinement analytically. And so there were just, uh, in effect, there were just zillions and zillions of gluons going across and um, in QCD. And um, this makes this presumably explains confinement, but it also makes calculations very difficult. These days we have computers, however, and there's, there are also some identities due to fears, um, which uh, are useful. Okay, anyway, so this is the QCD part of the standard uh, model. The rest of the standard model is, um, so the whole standard model is SU3 of color and SU2 left and the U1 of hypercharge. So there are 8 plus 3 plus 1, 12 generators. So there are 12 gauge bosons. And by the, okay, 12 gauge bosons, and um, let me focus now on how it is that the 12 gauge bosons leave only the, the or what the Higgs mechanism is, which will give masses to three of the four electroweak gauge bosons. And so what does the trick is something introduced a long time ago by Peter Higgs, which is that uh, he suggested that there was a, a, four, a two component, two complex component Higgs field and that was scalar and which transformed under under this uh, gauge transformation, the gauge transformation being uh, SU2 cross U1. And the SU2 acts only on the left hand fermions. Um, now the, these, these four component fields, for example, psi red is a two component psi left and a two component psi right. 
So I should have done green, let us say. So, so this is green left and green right. Um, so the the uh, the SU two part of this gauge uh, uh, gauge interaction or the symmetry and or the transformation, if you want, acts only on the upper two components of the four component Dirac field. And in fact, under Lorentz transformations, these guys move into them. In other words, a Lorentz transformation, say D of L, is actually one D here, D left, zero, zero, D right. These are two by two complex matrices. And you have zeros here. So many people think of the left-handed um, fermions as uh, different as uh, different independent fields from the right-handed um, fermions, and that way they think of the fact that SU2 acts only on the left-handed components as being um, more reasonable. Uh, anyway, it's it's. In my opinion, the standard model is has many really ugly features, and which um, cry out for um, explanation. And the explanation will presumably be found in the next, um, probably by Chinese physicists in the next 20 years. Um, Don't have much hope for this country. Anyway, um, so this is. Let me write down what U of X is. It's um, e to the i g a sigma a over two alpha a of X. So this is an SU two, and then plus i g prime y i over two beta of x. So that's the, that's the unitary transformation that is SU2 cross U1, and as I said, it's uh, the SU2 part acts on the left. And the, the Higgs part of the theory looks like this. L is minus d mu h gaga d mu h plus 1 over 4k trace of f mu nu, f mu nu. And this is the f mu nu of the SU2 plus U1. I'm, I'm just focusing on the, on the electroweak interactions here. The SU, the SU3 of quantum chromodynamics is conceptually, until you try to do a calculation, it's a simpler um, picture. It's just the SU3 acting on only the quarks, not the leptons. And this is the way everything interacts. On the other hand, for the um, electroweak theory, we have this. And the Higgs part of it is an m squared h squared minus a lambda h to the fourth. And um, what's this covariant derivative? Well, the covariant derivative acting on h is a two by two matrix, a derivative plus i g sigma a over two a a mu plus i g prime y, a 2 by 2 matrix over 2, b mu, acting on h. So h is, a t h is two complex uh, components, or four real fields. And it's a two vector, so it's appropriate to use 2 by 2 matrices to act on it. And this is the covariant derivative. Now, the minimum of the Higgs potential, you see 
see the energy of the Higgs potential, or the potential energy of the Higgs potential, is lambda h to the 4 minus m squared h squared. So if we just look at the magnitude of, um, of, of, uh, of the complex 2 vector, then this is lambda, let us say, v to the 4th minus m squared v squared. And so the minimum is when, I guess my choice of v was not great, because it is conventional. This is equal to then 4 lambda v cubed minus uh, 2 m squared v is equal to 0. If you cancel 1 v and a 2, you get lambda v squared is equal to uh, m squared. And so you see that the minimum is at v is equal to um, m over uh, is a 2, right? square root of 2 lambda, and that's what the magnitude of, of the two-vector field um, should be. Now, this theory has this SU2 cross 1 gauge invariance, and so we can rotate the um, this mean value, we can rotate it into basically whatever direction we want, and we can, and the standard thing is to say that the mean value of the Higgs field in the vacuum that minimizes the potential energy is 1 over the square root of 2, 0 v. And I'm just worried now that I've got a factor of 2 loose here. take them. This has a magnitude of one half b squared. In other words, h squared here is a half b squared, whereas I was saying that um, I was taking it to be b. Um, Well, of course, this is also, a, I also jumped from the notes to a slightly different calculation. Let's, let's look at it this way. Just take that to be the magnitude of H. And um, if we take that to be the magnitude of H, then what we get is this. And so then we get this equation, and all right, I guess this is, if I had stayed with the notes more carefully, this would have been obviated. So then we say that um, in the vacuum, the magnitude of H is this, and then we choose to call it 1 over root 2, 0 B. We make a gauge transformation so that the the, the non-zero part of the Higgs field is the second, is the real part of the second component. And um, since with a complex field you normally have one over root two the real field plus i times the other real field, um, that's where the root two comes from. And so this h squared is actually um, one half v squared. And now the second derivative of V um, would be the second derivative of that. So that would be 12 lambda h squared uh, minus 2 
m squared h, setting that, uh, the, the, setting h0, setting h equal to this value gives us 12 lambda over 2 lambda m squared minus 2 m squared, um, well, m squared, actually m to the 4 over, do I have, wait, this, this went away. And so, this thing is the, is the mass of the Higgs squared. And so it's 12 lambda h0 squared, which is m squared over 2 lambda, minus 2 m squared. And that seems to be 6 minus 2 is 4 m squared. There, I don't, I'm, I guess I have this. Well. What do you want to get? What do you like? I, I, I have a, I think I may have a, a factor one or two factors of two or square root of two loose. And um, since I've been improvising rather than following the notes religiously, it's, um, let me just give you the bottom line. The bottom line is that this is the potential. It's the energy of the potential is this. The energy of the field, energy density of the field is this. This is minimized for a certain value of H. And the value of H is um, given by this m over square root of 2 lambda. The, uh, from that, you can just in general, the second derivative of, um, of the action or the energy with respect to the value of the field gives you the mass of the field. And when you do that with respect to P, you get the mass of the Higgs in terms of these parameters, M and lambda. Um, of course, a priori, uh, people didn't know what, and Peter Higgs didn't know what the values of uh, M or uh, M and lambda were. But um, eventually, uh, first the value of, um, First, this value in the vacuum, this mean value, was found to be 246 GeV. So let me write that down. And I'll show you why this was, this was known from the masses of the W and the Z. And the mass of the Higgs, the Higgs was discovered at the LHC in 2012. And um, Further measurements at the LHC have determined its mass to be uh, about 125 GeV. And uh, this self-coupling lambda is, um, which I'm writing as m squared over 2 v squared. This is uh, 0 0.129. Um, Now, um, so uh, as I said, there's a factor of two loose, but the essential idea here is that there's a double, complex doublet of scalar fields. One of these scalar fields, the neutral scalar field, gets a mean value in the vacuum. Um, one can explain that at least heuristically and algebraically by saying that the Lagrangian has this uh, funny form. Um, the energy, therefore, is certainly bounded below, but the, mean, the minimum of the energy is not when H has a mean value of zero in the vacuum, but when it has a finite mean value. 
And uh, when, in particular, when one of the fields has this value, the neutral component, or the real component of the neutral field. Is it, is it a rigorous statement to say that the, the vacuum expectation value in the field is going to be such that, it, or, yeah, sorry, the vacuum expectation value in the field is going to be such that this potential is minimized? Is that, is, is that like true even? Well, that's, um, yeah, I would say so. I feel, yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, if, there are a lot of funny, there are a lot of issues here, obviously. But if you imagine that the field is constant in time and space, then um, if it's not at the value that minimizes the potential energy density, you've got an absolutely huge uh, amount of energy sitting there. Right, so. I mean, I guess, I don't know. It sort of, that sort of happens though with something like a harmonic oscillator though, right? It's like the, the minimum en energy configuration isn't such that the, isn't such that the potential energy is minimized. Oh, you know? you're seeing something different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, well, if we speak about the thing quantum mechanically, um, what you're talking about there is zero point energies, and that's something else. Okay. And um, in fact, the picture approximately is that that the the field is in a coherent state of the zero momentum mode mm. of the of the new of the real part of the neutral component of the sphere. And um, then, if this is all normal, if these operators are normally ordered, then the mean value, that mean value minimizes, in fact, puts the energy density equal to zero. But then there are also these vacuum fluctuations that you were referring to. And um, no, um, no one's gotten that. All right, now here's the interesting part, the really interesting part. The, um, in the Higgs, uh, the action for the Higgs field, there's the kinetic action, there's the action of the gauge fields. So this is, in fact, actually the whole electroweak sector apart from the fermions. Um, this thing gives the Higgs field its mean value in the vacuum. This part, these are the covariant derivatives of the Higgs field, and they are necessary, they're of this form, and they're necessary so that you have the, symmetry, the local symmetry of SU2 cross U1 acting on the two component complex Higgs field. Now, if we just look at this, what we see is that this gives us a mass term, and that mass term is H dagger minus I sigma A over 2 AA mu minus I G prime Y I over 2 B mu I G sigma A over 2 AA mu plus I G prime Y I over two B mu H. Just enough space to write that. So this is of the form. This is D mu H, and well, I should have written one of them upper. So let me put this guy's upper. This is this is this thing dagger, but I'm going to the limit in which the um, in which the I'm replacing the Higgs field with its mean value in the vacuum, and taking the mean value in the vacuum to be h is equal to one over root two zero v, where v is real. 
And so these are just the three Pauli matrices. This is a number, and this is a two by two identity matrix. Um, the, the, the i's turned into minus i's because this is the complex conjugate or the adjoint of the covariant derivative. And um, the fact is these generators are Hermitian, so they don't change on the Hermitian conjugation. And so now if we actually, it's I think instructive to work this out component by component. And so this is minus, if we pull out the one halves and also this root two, what we get is a factor of an eighth. We have zero V. And then we have here G times A3 mu plus G prime B mu G A1 mu plus I A2 mu G A1 mu minus I A2 mu minus G A3 somehow I put all the mu's down but Let me put them back up if I can. A3 mu plus G prime B mu. And let me get this in the right place. And that's just the first one. The second one is G. Oh god, I had the mu's in the right place. Sorry, let me put them back. They were in the right place. Here is where they're up. So this is G A3 mu plus G prime B mu G A1 mu plus I A2 mu One of the reasons why I don't like to use the, so many Greek letters is um, that we're not, I'm not Greek, and so I didn't grow up writing Greek as a child. Minus G A3 mu plus G prime B mu. And then finally, zero V. Okay, that's the whole expression. And if you just do the matrix multiplication, this is two by two matrices after all. This is minus V squared over eight. And then we have a two vector here that's G A1 mu plus I A2 mu. minus G A, sorry, A3 mu plus G con E mu. And then here G A1 mu minus I A2 mu minus G A3 mu plus G prime B mu and so this is one two vector that's vertical, this is a two vector that's horizontal. You dot them into each other and you get minus B squared over eight and then what's left, and this is the important part, g squared, a1 mu, a1 mu, plus a2 mu, a2 mu, plus minus g, 
a three mu plus g prime b mu times well, it's the same thing essentially, um, except for one index phrase. Okay, so that's that's what it actually is. It's it's this quadratic expression and this quadratic expression with a v squared out in front. So now what we see is that we have two massive gauge bosons, or three, sorry, three. This A1 and A2, and then this linear combination of A3 and B. And so what we've got is W plus and minus mu is one over root two, A1 mu minus or plus I, a2 mu and z mu is 1 over the square root of g squared plus g prime squared g a3 mu minus g prime b mu. So those are the three bosons that get mass. The second term here is the mass squared, is proportional to the mass squared of the z, and this is proportional to the sum of the mass squares of the w of the two of the charged w's. Um, notice that we have a one over root two in the conventional normalization of a complex field, and we don't have a one over root two for the conventional normalization of a real field. Um, these mass terms then are, in fact, I should have called, well, I did call it L sub m. L sub m, in terms of all these, actually boils down to something that we can write rather simply g squared, b squared over 4, W minus mu, W plus mu, minus G squared plus G prime squared, V squared over 8, Z mu, Z mu. Uh, the W's were, I guess they were discovered first at Lab, I think, or at Lab, I believe. Anyway, the mass of the W, which is GV over 2, the current value is 80.370 plus or minus 0 0.012 GV, and the mass of the Z is. Um, square root of g squared plus g prime squared v over 2. And this is 91.1876 plus or minus 0 0.0021 gv. And the reason why this is so much more accurate than that is that you can make the z on an e, with an E plus E minus collider. And so you have a, an initial state, electron proton, that you understand. And you can control its energy very uh, precisely. And uh, so that measurement was done initially at left. And I, I'm not sure where the, what, what the origin of the best value is. But it's um, anyway. It's it's true that if you if you have to measure something, um, 
in a proton collide. Well, proton collide has just produced messes. And so, because you have, especially when you have proton, proton, um, because then you have two particles that you don't understand colliding, and they're strongly interacting. And so you get all kinds of stuff in the final state, as I was describing. In fact, if you look at the Feynman diagram behind Sam in the back there, or in the front. The lightning star? That's, that's what the thing looks like. And so it's, so the, in fact, that may be why at the LHC, the, there's been essentially one discovery, the Higgs. Um, and also at Fermilab, it, it seems to me that there was the amount of money that went into Fermilab and into the LHC, compared with the physical results that came out, and then compare that with a slack with an electron-positron collider, or even just a linear electron accelerator, the amount of money that went in and the amount of physics that came out, it's just night and day. The, the, the yield, the cost effectiveness of having an electron collider, or for that matter, a muon collider, if we have them, is, is just very much better than a, um, a with a proton machine. All right, well, here I've written the mass eigenstates in terms of um, the uh, gauge fields, the three gauge fields of SU2 left, A1, A2, and A3, and the gauge field of uh, U1 of hypercharge. Um, notice that there's a combination that's orthogonal to this. And the orthogonal combination would be G prime A3 plus G B mu. And that's the one that remains massless. And that's the photon. So the photon is 1 over square root 2 G squared plus G prime squared. And it's G prime A3 mu plus G B mu. And you see that's orthogonal to this, and there's no sign of a mass term for it over here. So the photon remains massless. Now, we can rewrite the initial gauge fields in terms of the mass eigenstates. And if we do that, we get that A1 mu is 1 over root 2 w plus mu plus w minus mu. A2 mu is 1 over root 2. w minus mu minus w plus mu. A3 mu is, I'm sorry, there's an i here. Uh, 1 over square root of g squared plus g prime squared g prime a mu plus g z mu and b mu is 1 over square root of g squared plus g prime squared g a mu minus g prime z mu so these are the um, these are the original gauge fields expressed in terms of the mass eigenstate fields. All right, now let's look at the covariant derivative um, for fermion of a certain hypercharge. Um, coupling to these uh, gauge fields. And it's a pretty big expression, so maybe I'll start it here and then go up there. Um, so the covariant derivative is identity d mu 
plus IG sigma A over 2 AAU plus IG prime YI B mu. And so writing it up here, I've got I D mu plus I G and sigma one over two root two W plus mu plus W minus mu plus sigma two over two I root two W minus mu minus W plus mu plus sigma three over two square root of g squared plus g prime squared g prime a mu plus g z mu let me see if I can squeeze the rest of it in here plus i g prime y over square root of g squared plus g prime squared g a mu minus g prime z mu. Okay, so that's the covariant derivative acting on the Higgs field or the fermions. Um, apart from the fact that uh, if we act on a Dirac fermion, we have to project out the um, left-handed part of the fermion. We can't have this act on the um, right-handed components. And we can write this a little more neatly as I D mu plus I G over root 2 W plus mu T plus plus W minus mu T minus plus I over the square root of G squared plus G prime squared Z mu G squared T3 minus G prime squared Y I. Okay, so the Z, sorry, the Z coupling is here, and the W's are there, and of course I left out the photon. Putting that in, we get I G prime over square root of g squared plus g prime squared a mu times t3 plus y i. Okay, so photon z w's. And what is t plus or minus? t plus or minus is equal to a half sigma 1 plus or minus i. The um, electric charge, or the charge of the electron, or the absolute value of the charge of the electron is E, and that's G G prime over the square root of G squared plus G prime squared. And I'm taking E as the positive, the absolute value of that. Um, the charge operator here is the thing that multiplies the proton, and that's T3 plus Y. So this is T3 
plus y times the identity. And now, suppose we, um, I don't know why I used a capital E. Let me change it to a capital L. Suppose L sub L um, is a doublet of lepton fields and um, I'm talking about here the electron and the um, electron neutrino and um, I'm talking about the left-handed two components of each field and one could equally well talk about the um, mu neutrino and the muon the tau neutrino and the tau particle so any of these um, uh, doublets. And then if we look at the photon part of that, what we have is GG prime over the square root of G squared plus G prime squared A mu T3 plus Y I on say L sub L, well this is E, this part just gives you E of course, the positive, the absolute value of the charge of the electron, A mu T3 plus Y I L sub L, and um, if we, if we give hyper, if we say that that on this doublet, in other words, we say y on L sub L is minus one half L sub L. In other words, we say that the hypercharge operator acting on the left-handed left on the lepton fields, because it acts on left or right-handed, because it's the generator of the U1. Um, it has the eigenvalue of minus one half then this is a minus one half, and so this is equal to E A mu T3 minus a, uh, minus a half times the identity and times L sub L. And then that then is E A mu, a two by two matrix, zero, zero, minus, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, and then this L sub L. Let me just write it as L sub L there. And if we then remember what L sub L is, it's uh, nu E and E, for example. And so that just gives us minus E A mu E. And um, Uh, this E is the absolute value of the charge of the electron. This E is the electron field. And I think I, what I should have done here, um, or l let's put it this way, when this is acting on fermions, the, the part that uh, the part, that the, the part that you need a projection operator on to the upper components is the, the sigmas, not the y and the b. So the sigma part only acts on the left-handed part of the fermions. And so since So the, um, whereas the, the B mu part acts on, on uh, all four components. And what, I, what this caused me to pause here a moment is that um, the 
B mu acts on all four components, but the so let's see where okay. So this part acts only on the upper two components, whereas this acts on all four components. Um, So then we re-express things in terms of the of the of the Z and the photon and I think what what I should have done was put in the explicitly the projection operators on the upper components of the fermion fields. Um, anyway, the, the relationship between the Z and the photon It can be written in terms of an angle, which is called the weak mixing angle. It's also called the Weinberg angle. And in fact, it was called the Weinberg angle more than the weak mixing angle in the early days. And um, Here the relationship is A3 and B, uh, and this two by two matrix gives you the Z and the and the photon. Um, so the cosine of the weak mixing angle then is G over this square root of G squared plus G prime squared, and the sine of the weak mixing angle is. Um, G prime over the square root of G squared plus G prime squared. And, um, well, this, there's no more space to write. Um, I guess I'll get rid of the white board. charge here is T3 plus YI, and so obviously YI is Q minus T3, and so that lets one write one of these terms, in other words, the Z mu term that's G squared T3 minus G prime squared Y over square root of g squared plus g prime squared. This is z mu times g squared plus g prime squared t3 minus g prime squared q over, I'm running out of ink here, g squared plus g prime squared. I think I'll retire this. And switch to the blue one. And so now the photon term is G G prime or square root of G squared plus G prime squared A mu times T3 plus Y, and this is G G prime over square root of G squared plus G prime squared, 
a mu, and it's just times q. The coupling to the z, let me skip a couple of steps and just get to the coupling to the z. It's g over cosine of the weak mixing angle, z mu, and then what's left is t3 minus sine squared beta w times q. And um, uh, E, in fact, is G times sine of theta W. And um, so the photon coupling, um, which I wrote this way, can also be written as E. A mu just Q. So that's what you'd expect the charge operator. Um, so the final way of, well, I don't know about the final way, but a final way of writing the covariant derivative is I d mu. I G over root 2 W plus mu T plus plus W minus mu T minus plus I G over cos theta weak Z mu T3 minus sine squared theta w times q. And um, so here the idea is that t is one half sigma on left-handed fermions, and T is just zero on the right-handed fermion. So that's, that's the convention that I've been following there. Um, this sine squared theta w um, has been measured to several figures, and it is sine squared theta w is 0 0.231224 and um, that means that theta to theta weak is around um, 0 0.50163 and the V that I said previously was 246 the current value is 246.22 GeV So the, the thing that I think is really nice about this, um, despite all the read all the subscripts and superscripts and notation and some and so forth, is that the W and the Z masses come about because it's a gauge theory in which the two-component Higgs field has uh, is acted upon by a covariant derivative. In other words, it's not it's not simply. In other words, if it were simply d mu h dagger d mu h, there wouldn't be any the the, the gauge bosons would not get mass. They're getting mass because you have a, uh, because it's a gauge theory with local symmetry, the no local symmetry requires that the gauge fields appear in the covariant derivatives in order for the derivatives to transform like the field so that you have the local symmetry. Then, for reasons that aren't understood, the Higgs field 
get some mean value in the vacuum, and um, that mean value then, together with these covariant derivatives, means that certain gauge fields get masses and others don't. Um, okay, so that, that's the nice part of this. Um, the not so nice part is that the fermions get masses through the Higgs mechanism also, but in a way that's completely arbitrary. In other words, um, let's see, I'm, the part that, yeah, let me skip a section. I may come back to it next week, but let me just show you what, um, what the mass terms here. Well, this is the Dirac mass term, which is psi bar minus m psi bar psi. And um, this is minus i m psi dag again is zero psi. And we can rewrite this as minus i m psi dag again is zero. And then a left-handed projection operator and a right-handed projection operator, psi. And um, these projection operators are, yeah, I shouldn't have skipped that section, actually. Well, let me say what they are. PL is. a half, one plus gamma five, and um, gamma five, remember, is one zero minus one in the gamma note with the choices, Weinberg choices of gamma matrices. And so this is simply um, one zero zero zero. And P right, on the other hand, is one half, one minus gamma five. And of course, gamma five squared is one. Um, and so this minus M psi bar psi, one can rewrite it as minus M psi bar right psi left minus m psi bar left psi right, where psi left and psi bar, or psi left, in other words, uh, there's no more place to write, psi, psi right is p right on psi, psi left is P left on side. And so psi left is the upper two components, psi right is the lower two components. say psi left is e v i theta psi left, psi right e to the i p psi right 
and then the mass term turns into minus m e to the i theta minus b psi bar right psi left minus m e to the minus i minus i theta minus b uh, psi bar left psi right um, right okay um, anyway the Dirac mass term which is minus m psi bar psi is minus m psi left dagger psi right plus psi right dagger psi left. And let me just mention why these terms are invariant under Lorentz transformations. Under a Lorentz transformation, psi left prime goes as e to the minus z dot sigma psi left. And psi right prime, on the other hand, is e to the z star dot sigma psi right. So they did, the, under the same Lorentz transformation, they transform in these different ways. This, the z is a, is a complex triplet. And, and um, so the z has six real components. And those are three for rotations and three for boosts. So this is how things transform under Lorentz transformation. And so then, psi left prime dagger, psi prime right, is psi left dagger, and then you have an adjoint of that, so this is e to the minus z star dot sigma. Remember, sigma is Hermitian. And uh, psi right prime is just e to the z star dot sigma psi right. So you see, this term is invariant, which is why the Dirac mass term is invariant under Lorentz transformations. Of course, Dirac was no fool when he wrote it down initially. Um, the same thing is true for psi prime right dagger. Psi left prime is psi right prime dagger. Well, psi right dagger, psi left. So that's, how, well, maybe I should just show you that. That one is psi left dagger and it's e to the z dot sigma, e to the minus z dot sigma, so right. And so that's, well, I'll put the primes back in, so that's psi left dagger, psi right. So that's the invariant of the variance of that term. But now we've got the problem that psi left moves under the left-handed gauge transformation. Psi right doesn't. And so now, although the Dirac mass term is invariant under Lorentz transformations, it's not invariant under gauge transformations that are purely left-handed. And so to cope with that, one, the Higgs field copes with that problem as well. And um, the way that works is to have something like this, Q left, dagger h d right. Okay, now what is that going to do? This is a doublet of left-handed quark fields and this is the Higgs field and so under the SU2 this transforms one way and this because of the adjoint the other way and so it can. This thing remains constant. miserable abbreviation, and this is SU2 invariant. So that's basically the way it works. Um, and if we look at what that is, if we go into the vacuum, this just is um, zero V. No, I'm sorry, that's the quark thing. The quark thing is, let us say, up, left, dagger, 
down, left, dagger. That's Q dagger left. H is then just zero V and then D right. And so this just gives us D left dagger, D right times V. So now you see that's a mass term. That's, this is then Lorentz invariant. because it's d left dagger d right. V then is a mean value in the vacuum, that's that 246. And so if you just pull out of your nose the appropriate number and put it here, you see you've got that the mass of the d quark is equal to CV. So V is the mean value of the Higgs field, but C is just an arbitrary number that's just defined to be MD over V. So in other words, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's no structure that we know of that tells us where this C comes from. It's just chosen, six constants are chosen to fit the six quarks and another three are chosen to fit the three massive leptons. And for that matter, another three to fit the three neutrinos, although that's a more complicated story. Um, so we're, we're at the end of the hour here. Uh, um, I mean, there is some structure to this, namely that the Higgs field played an essential role in the mass thing, in the mass in the generation of mass, but whereas in the gauge field sector, the coupling constants of the gauge fields um, determined the masses of the gauge fields. Here, we don't have any explanation for where the seas come from. And um, so that's not very nice. So uh, also, the, as, you'll, as we'll see, I guess we'll spend one more period on this. Um, the quantum numbers for the right-handed fields are really weird. And they're weird because of this uh, asymmetry of having SU2 act on the left-handed fields, not on the right-handed field. So these quantum numbers get to be rather funny. Things like one six. All right, well, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Um, although why we celebrate st stealing the country from the Indians and Murdering a hundred million turkeys, I don't know. So, uh, who's hungry? Anybody?